So that's us recording. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on agroforestry in the Uplands Farmer Perspectives. Um, this is part of a Scottish government funded project, um, which is part of the Knowledge Transfer Innovation Fund. Um, and it's a project that uh, we've got a collaboration of a number of organisations who have come together um, who are supporting and promoting ideas around agroecology, uh, which is essentially the ecosystem, um, the ecology of the food ecosystem, if you like. So thinking about ecological principles and practices um, from, from the farm gate beyond to the fork. And one aspect of agroecology is quite often, um, which is quite often kind of represented and, and promoted, and particularly now um, as a way of uh, addressing climate mitigation and adaptation is agroforestry. Um, so really, really excited to be able to spend some time this afternoon talking to you about this really uh, important topic, which both uh, Andrew, who's our guest speaker, and myself are really passionate about. Um, so uh, for those folk who have just come in, you should see that there is a poll um, that we've got running at the moment. If you don't mind, it'd be really helpful if you could just say where you are based, whether that's Scotland, rest of UK. And my optimism that somebody from elsewhere in the world will be joining us has, uh, has been rightly uh, met because we do have somebody who isn't rest of UK, but is rest of the world. Maybe they just ticked that because they heard me being hopeful that we'd got to global reach by now. Um, so enough of my uh, waffling on. Um, this, this afternoon's webinar is primarily, you're gonna be hearing from two farmers, uh, one of whom is Andrew Barber, the other is me. Uh, and we're gonna be talking to you about our experiences of agroforestry in an upland context. Um, so we're gonna kick off with Andrew, who's gonna do a presentation and he'll tell you more about himself than I can possibly do justice to. Um, we'll then have some questions. And I will then do a presentation about what we're doing here in our corner of Northeast Aberdeenshire. Uh, so if you have uh, any questions, we are in a meeting setup. So please use the chat to post questions, which I will try and collect up as we go through. Um, we don't have the Q&A box, it is just the chat option. So please do put your questions in there and then we'll hopefully get to a point at the end where we can also have a bit of a chat about all things upland silver pasture. Right, I think that's enough for me. So I'm gonna hand over to Andrew, but I just need to um, present his um, PowerPoint. So if you just bear with me while I get that up and running. Okay, I'm hoping that you can all see that wonderful photo of a cow and calf in the trees in presentation mode. Brilliant. Okay, Andrew, over to you. Hello and good evening, everyone. Thank you, Nikki. And uh, I don't intend to say anything about myself. <laughs> Absolutely not necessary. <laughs> um, the less said, the better. Um, but the reason that we get asked to talk about this kind of thing uh, is that for the last few, well, uh, I don't know, quite a while we've been trying to establish new woodland in this kind of model, this kind of land use agroforestry, where you're planning the grazing with growing trees together. So that's why we get called upon, because it has to be said, farmers have been grazing animals in woodlands for ever and a, ever and a day in every country that they've ever had livestock and trees grow, go together. So it's a, it's a broad, broad experience. But it's tended to be, certainly in recent times, that uh, the farming side has ignored the trees and often to the detriment of the trees. So uh, um, that's uh, one reason, and certainly ecologists would tend to think that way, one reason why people tended to think you've got to keep animals out of trees. Um, and that is firmly not our belief, uh, and I know Nikki uh, takes it to even more extremes, <laughs> so it's, uh, that's what I want to share with you today and a little bit of, about our experience of managing stock um, in, in amongst the trees. Um, Nikki is managing my slides for me because my computer can't cope with that, so could we have the next slide please, Nikki? And here is a view of the farm where we are, Fincastle. We're in Highland Perthshire, 
um, we're west of Pitlochry, for those of you who know this part of the world. And it's a 500, a quick word about the farm so you can understand uh, how the things fit in. It's a 500 hectare unit. And on the left hand side, the lower part is largely wooded, which is our, been our actions mostly. Um, and is under different, slightly different forms of wood pasture. The middle part of the farm you see is the engine of the farm. That's our hay silage ground. And the upper parts of the farm by and large have no trees in them. They're, they're all designated for their open ground habitats. We're not actually allowed to plant anything up there. Um, but we keep, we run it, um, it's a cattle sheep unit and um, we broadly run cattle on these high grasslands uh, in the summer months through and uh, late as we can hold them out there. And then they come down into lower ground in the for the autumn late autumn and into a shed um for the for the winter months um and sheep do the reverse we keep the sheep off these high grasslands where they're high uh, conservation value and we keep them on the improved pasture and we move them around then we, we run rotational grazing systems um next slide please And it's worth just saying briefly a bit about what is agroforestry, because it, it seems that um, the definitions vary and change according to who you're talking to. But traditionally, it's uh, a term that's been used for any land use system where trees or bushes on the one hand and an agricultural crop on the other are grown on the same parcel of land. But some folks have widened it to include shelter belts or riparian woodland where, let's say, stalker, there is no agricultural crop element involved. Hedgerows are also included, probably quite rightly. Um, so there's a spruce block behind our farm there, and that's definitely not agroforestry. And arguably, you know, um, high value ancient woodland sites, which don't require grazing regularly, would not be part of agroforestry and should not be part. Um, so an acid grazed woodland is not, to my mind, an agroforestry system. Anyway, if we move on. Um, and we were interested in wood pasture. Um, principally, we were wanting to grow trees, but we didn't want to lose land off the farm. So that's where we started to have an interest in it. We saw it as a way of having our cake and eat it in, in sort of Johnson style. So that's our interest started uh, about 20 years ago in this. And uh, so and I think wood pasture was the term we were using in our heads, silver pasture, um, I don't know, whatever you want to call it anyway. And if we move on to the next slide, we'll just see what we think it is. Wood pasture has these three components and you've got to think about all three components. Um, you've got to think about the trees and their health, the health of the ground vegetation and the livestock. And so I'm gonna mostly talk about the livestock today, but bear in mind that these other three components are really are, are equally important. Um, and the ground vegetation obviously is, re is relevant to the livestock, but the trees are relevant to the livestock too. It's, it's an interactive system. And that's, that's the key, key, key point. Um, if we move on, And so what I'm going to principally concentrate on today is the kind of questions that get thrown at us. And the first is how to establish, I'm not going to spend much time, well, in fact, I'm not going to spend any time on this. We can come back to it if folks are interested. But how do you establish, in, how do you get trees away um, in, is the first question that most farms might be thinking about. Do I have to give up the ground? How long do I have to go, give up the ground for? We can come back to that if time allows or if folks are interested. But if we move on, um, and you can see from that photograph, we've got different systems, different approaches there. But if we look at then at the, the, this, the key component from a farmer's point of view is always going to be the livestock. And 
you really have to treat cattle and sheep separately. Um, we keep both, as I said, and um, the first thing you have to say is that the cow is a woodland animal and behaves like a woodland animal that's happy in amongst trees. And what we've strived to do, and we've been heavily influenced by, um, I suppose, our exposure to more modern ideas of welfare, you know, moving past the, 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 the five freedoms, um, adaptive behavior is quite a key idea now in modern welfare understanding so that you allow animals to maximize their well-being. And for most folks, if you stick a, an animal into a field, you don't think twice about it. The animal's in the field and you're interested in is there enough grass for it, um, et cetera, et cetera. You don't think about, well, we certainly didn't. We used to think too much about the other needs, but natural behavior of these animals, um, adaptive behavior, is absolutely key to good welfare systems and trees provide that for cattle. There's no doubt about it in our heads. So our aim has been to try and make sure that in each grazing block of ground, uh, animals have access to trees because uh, on that high hill ground you saw in an earlier picture, it's pretty treeless, but there's one of the grazing blocks of ground up there has a uh, uh, ele element of woodland in it. And when the animals are in there, they use those trees daily or nightly to be precise. And it's, uh, you can pretty much set your clock by when they're going into the trees, when they come out. And they use it obviously also for shelter in heavy rain situations. Um, so our ideal is to have every management unit with access to woodland. Um, and that's where we're moving towards on the farm. There's lots of other reasons to do that, but um, it's for the, the driving force for us has been uh, this idea of welfare. So allied to that, folks always ask about flies. Well, f flies are much worse in woodland. We're at a thousand feet, so that gives us a bit of an advantage. But um, we find that when you let animals in under the trees, you don't get the poached edge, which you would have with say a shelter belt where the trees are, and the animals are kept apart by a fence. You don't get that stinking mess around the edge where the animals are all crowding to get under the trees and you get the ground poached up and it stinks. And that draws in flies, absolutely. But when you let animals underneath, you have a much cleaner environment. We've not seen any problem with flies at all. And there is research to show that, uh, down from England anyway, that um, to show that fly problems are less when you allow animals in uh, under, under trees. So there is data to back that up. And so that's the key point here in the silver pasture system, shelter inside the wood under the tree canopy and animals are utilizing that. Um, these cattle are absolutely, but they choose to graze quite often outside the woodland and then, I would say their main grazing behavior is outside, even when there's grass under. And when we come to think about what, um, oh, we're going backwards, what you come to think about uh, the health of the ground vegetation or the state of the ground vegetation, you can, you can understand why. We'll come to that in a wee bit. Um, but I suppose when you're talking about cattle, cattle are secure in woodland. They feel pretty happy in there and, um, that behavior is very obvious to see. Um, they like calving in woodland. That's one thing we knew right from the start because animals were always breaking into woodland even when we were trying to keep them out <laughs> to, to, to calf. So, um, you know, that says an awful lot. Where animals choose to calve says an awful lot. We had 10 cows calve in one block last year and nine out of the 10 of them chose to carve in the woodland element of that grazing block of ground. Um, they're choosing that ground quite deliberately for their carving. And um, my wife has just phoned me just now to say a heifer has just carved. And where was the heifer in exactly that uh, type of ground under cover in the trees? Um, so it's ongoing. There's no doubt about it that from up, as we see it, cattle like that security aspect. But if we move on to sheep, Security is a rather different thing for sheep and trees. Um, and there's sheep which do not appear to be a particularly a woodland animal, at least not our breeds, and we're just using modern um, modern you know breeds like Texel, Clin, Chibiot, 
um, kind of bloodlines here. Um, you'd, what you'd have to say is that on the, on the face of it, they don't use trees terribly much, but that's when you're wandering around in the daytime. If you go around at night, you will find a very different story. And sheep use uh, the shelter from trees enormously in the winter. And this last couple of weeks of really dirty weather, the sheep have been all in the trees every night. And um, they're so sensitive to temperature, they're so sensitive to wind that anything that um, gets them out of gets them into a higher temperature or into a, a lower wind speed area is of interest to them. So winter spring is a key point, key time, and then spring, the grass comes early under a tree canopy that pulls these animals in. Um, but from a security point of view, sheep need to see out, they need to see what's coming because uh, they're, they're, they just have the feeling of an animal that is much, much uh, more insecure in woodland, unlike cattle. And you can understand why they've come from a, uh, a background of being jumped on by every type of carnivore, the you know, ambush predator from lynx to whatever over, the, over their uh, evolutionary history. So um, it's, they do have a very different use, but it's a very important um, aspect for on, on our ground at our altitude, the shelter from sheep, uh, for sheep in these winter spring periods, not so much as you see in this picture for lambing, but in the periods before that. Um, and that has a big, um, uh, it has a big impact on the energy budgets of these animals and saves us quite a lot of money. Um, so we can talk about that later at some stage if folks are interested. Uh, flies, again, we haven't had a problem with, but um, adaptive behaviour teaches us that uh, when you give animals these access to uh, woodlands, they use it in the winter, spring, much less so in the summertime. And if we move on, um, tree welfare, I'm not going to say a great deal about that, but as a key component of the system, you've got to pay attention to how the trees are faring, and trees are incredibly robust. So uh, if folks want to talk about that at a later stage, more than welcome to, but um, we find, we were terribly nervous about animals in amongst trees from the tree health point of view, and we've really become much more uh, relaxed about it. Um, Trees and cattle in particular are incredibly robust. Sheep have the potential to cause considerable damage, particularly this kind of animal, a lamb, which if the trees are too whippy, can just about walk up a tree and walk it over and, uh, and browse it down. So the tree's got to be robust enough to cope with that. Um, Norway spruce uh, will get bark stripped. Um, bird cherry gets bark stripped, some occasional willow, even ash, um, pretty robust from bark stripping, but other species really robust. Um, so if we move on to the ground, um, the next slide and the, the ground vegetation. Um, and again, if you look at what happens under the canopy and the work that's been done in different trials, but here in Scotland too, back in the 1980s, shows you why animals tend to graze outside woodland rather than in the summertime, rather than underneath trees. And that's because it tends to be the sugar content of grass it drops underneath the tree canopy. So palatability is reduced, but that gets reversed in drought conditions. Um, and the, the one thing that folks don't talk about, and we see very as, as being very important, we've seen it here, is that when you rotationally graze, and I think that is a really important subject for uh, all farms going forward with livestock, you tend to, um, it tends to suit regenerating trees. So we have blocks of um, semi-natural woodland that are, that are regenerating with quite, um, quite high grazing impacts, but done over a short period because we're rotationally grazing. Set stocking causes much greater damage. So the way you manage, or the way we've been managing stock in amongst these trees and in different blocks with woody vegetation, I think is really key to the health of that 
ground vegetation. And that's, it's good news for the animals, but it's also good news for the ground flora. So that is a key point I'd like to bring up. If we move on, Managing stock and how that's, this is the question that people always ask. How can you see, you can't see your sheep through here. You can't see the stock, the cattle. How do you do it? Well, the answer is with cows, they're dead easy to see the cows. Um, you can walk around, drive around when you have this kind of alley system or an open woodland structure and a silver pasture system is going to have an open, whatever form is going to have an open canopy to it. Um, and sheep are a bit more difficult, but you've got to have a dog, as we do here in this one, that is a good driving dog. And um, you, in a block of ground like this, it, where your fences are and where your rides are becomes incredibly important. So if you are designing new block or you're thinking about a silver pasture block or, or whatever you're thinking about it, think where your alleys need to be for the sheep moving. And then managing stock through in a system like that becomes very easy. You can get round with a bike if you need to in something like this. Um, uh, but the animals will tend to run lines and they will move to either the high ground or to where your fence, where they know the where they know gates are or whatever. Open areas around gates is important, um, all this kind of stuff. So there's ways to get around the uh, problems that you might imagine would be quite bad in a block like this. And I suppose the other thing to say is scale is really important. And if you are thinking about new blocks of ground, you've got to think about scale uh, as well. And we um, lost our, as an extreme, we lost uh, 50 young stock into uh, our neighboring plantation, uh, which is run by the Forestry Commission, and it took us two days to find them, but that's a thousand hectares of woodland. So it's uh, scale becomes um, very difficult. And I wouldn't uh, uh, advocate a thousand hectares of silver pasture um, if you were uh, inclined to think of such things. Um, hardly likely, I guess, but uh, you are, you'll get the point. Um, and I guess my 20 minutes is coming close to an end, so I should move on. Um, and we can again come back to that aspect if you'd like. Um, and so really uh, all I can, all I need to say at this point is thanks. And I hope I haven't prattled on too long. Um, over to you, Nikki. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was brilliant. And um, some lovely photos as well in there. And what that's really made me realise is I need to get a drone and get some photos of here because um, all of my photos are taken mostly from just sitting on the floor. So, yeah, some great photos from above. Um, we do have a couple of questions. There are some questions about establishment, but I think we'll come to those at the end, maybe. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to the establishment questions. Um, but there was a question about, um, you did touch on this, but um, a question I think from Mary for you about trees and tree roots removing valuable nutrients from grazing ground. Um, and so uh, you did touch on this a little bit, but maybe worth just expanding slightly on that, Andrew? Yeah, well, I think the um, uh, water is the one thing you might want to be concerned about. Um, in certain soil conditions, but trees cycle nutrients and they cycle the, the traditional view. And this is one of the points that proponents of these kind of systems make, and they have evidence for it, is that they pull nutrients from a much deeper soil horizon than uh, many grass species or, or the kind of um, plants that you might normally see in an open field. So they tend to be good from that point of view. Um, but uh, Clearly, if there's a very strong canopy and there's no light there, then light and water become the limiting factors for, can become the limiting factors for um, other, other species. So that's, but that's the trick in agroforestry is balancing. It's, it's about light, it's about management of the canopy is, from a tree point of view, is a really important issue. So does that help? I think that really helps and that perfectly links to a question that Vicky just asked about how do you manage the canopy to ensure grass growth underneath and I guess that's linked you know to your planting densities or to thinning um, and yeah kind of thinking about those aspects as well. 
Yeah, well, thin, thinning, uh, you, you, any systems, and, and we've been, our objectives of management were always to produce timber as well as, um, uh, you know, these other things like early grass growth and whatnot. And so we've run systems which have planted higher numbers of trees early on, and then you come along and thin them. <coughs> And so the thinning is an absolutely crucial part of the management regime. Um, uh, so 100% important. And our aim is to always try and keep the canopy levels at about the 50, 60%. Uh, that's our target. Uh, and, and that's just a, a feel. You know, I'm not saying that's absolutely the right figure. Different people will have different ideas on different types of ground, but that's, that's as we see it. And, and we've tried to learn from... Other, other places, other countries where, you know, who've got a longer history of doing this kind of thing. The Swedes in particular uh, have um, a lot of experience in this. And so, yeah, that, that's uh, th thinning is a, is a key part of it. And you might then ask, what do we do with the thinnings? That's a question for someone else to ask. <laughs> but that's, uh, I'll, I'll hand you back to Nikki. Thanks, Andrew. And I have to say that, um, so when, <clears throat> excuse me, Andrew came to see us last year, um, the thing that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, there we go, frog in the throat, um, that the com we were having a conversation about um, tree management. And you'll, you'll see from the presentation I'm about to give that we're grazing other people's ground. And that was something that's really kind of changed our thinking is that this isn't just about the livestock, which is what we were primarily uh, kind of engaging with agroforestry for was the livestock benefits, but actually it's also about managing the trees. So this isn't just about, you know, ways to manage livestock. It's, it's thinking about how do you manage the trees to make sure that they are healthy, that they are um, receiving as many benefits as, as the rest of the system. Um, so yeah, definitely something that we're thinking far more about now and, and how, we, how we support that. Um, I'm going to just jump into my presentation, if that's okay, and then we will come back to questions. Um, so I will just start showing my screen. Um, hopefully this will be okay. Now, if you could just, hopefully you can see some horned cattle in the woods. Um, yeah, no, okay. Is that there now? No, we've got, okay, let me try again. Oh, it came up and disappeared again. There was obviously a delay. Right, let's try again. Hopefully you can see that. I'm, I'm waiting for Stefan to put a, a thumb up or not, because he's one of the only people that I can see at the moment on the side of my screen, but we've got... Sod's law that Andrew's presentation worked brilliantly and then oh we're there brilliant thank you <laughs> thanks for the thumbs up Stefan okay so upland agroforestry this is just our perspective so uh, my husband and I run grumpy and graziers we're based at how mill if you use social media please do um, give us a follow particularly on twitter where you'll hear lots of stories about the wee mob who you can see here um, and primarily me sharing things like the hashtag cows in trees which is a particular favorite and I'm just going to talk a little bit about who we are and what we're doing um, and what that looks like for us. So um, we live, I said northeast Aberdeenshire earlier, and I didn't mean that at all. I meant northeast Scotland, Aberdeenshire, but we live on uh, near Huntley on the River Deverin. We just own 18 acres at home. Um, and I realise that that's quite a privileged thing to be able to say just 18 acres. Um, but this is the view from our, our meadow. And you can see the Deverin just there at the bottom. Um, we, over the last couple of years, have secured sort of additional 100 acres um, under various licenses and arrangements with a, an additional um, 400 coming under management this year. We use holistic management um, as a framework for how we approach our, our farm business. Um, so for any of you who don't know what that is, um, I really recommend looking up the work of Alan Savory um, and thinking about holistic management as a framework for management because it just makes everything easier for us in terms of um, planning and decision making. We currently have 20 cattle with um, a few more on the way next week, next two weeks. Um, and then we will be calving in May and June. So hopefully we'll be increasing numbers there. And we've very much been aiming to start small and grow the herd. Um, and it was interesting. I came to do this presentation and just edit some slides and 
Um, last time I gave a similar presentation, we, we had half the number of cattle. So it seems that the, the wee mob is growing and, and with the additional land we're taking on this year, I'm not sure we'll be able to call them the wee mob anymore. Um, all of our, uh, our output is beef and we sell that via direct beef sales to the local community. Um, <clears throat> So a little bit more about about where we are. I mean, we got down last winter. This winter has been particularly mild. Last year was hard going. It was uh, up to minus 20 degrees at some for about a week. It was pretty hard with no water and yeah, difficult time. So it can get pretty rough. We're right on the edge of the Cabrac. Um, we're very close to the Cairngorms, so it can get really windy. The winds, um, prevailing winds whip off the, the plateau and come straight here. Um, we just have a very small buyer. There really isn't any kind of um, infrastructure for housing any animals. Um, so our livestock are outside 365 days of the year. Um, we have about eight to nine acres of native um, woodland, broadleaf woodland on our land that we own. And we've been doing some additional planting. So in that photograph, um, you can see there's a bank uh, in, at the back of the photo and there's a gap in the middle of it. So all of that has now been planted up with trees. And at the bottom of that bank is a burn. Um, and we've been putting in quite a bit of riparian planting there just to join up the gaps where there have been trees and then others that have been taken down we're just replacing. It's pretty marginal, we're considered to be less favoured, but we have these beautifully diverse native swords, um, so we don't do any kind of um, improvement with our pasture, everything is um, is kind of naturally occurring in native species plants. And we, we sit at about 270 to 300 metres above sea level with some of our ground going up to 340. So similar sort of um, elevation to Andrew. So I'm going to talk a little bit just about some of the grazing that we um, that we do, and you can see from that from this photograph that most of the woodland that we're grazing in is fairly young, maybe sort of 30 years old maximum. Most of it are a little bit younger than that, and we do also have some lovely older old birch blocks as well, um, which we really enjoy putting the cattle through and uh, make great carving areas. Um, there is a mix of broadleaf, but also some larch and Scots pine, and we have some other. Um, coniferous plants um, trees as well and there's this wonderful I never realized that cattle would eat, eat needles like you can see here um, in this photo and there's this wonderful smell well maybe not so wonderful of like 80s toilet cleaner when you walk past these trees because the cattle have been eating into them and you get that very strong sort of pine scent so it's always fascinating for us to see how our cattle interact with the woodland um, just to touch a little bit on, on what agroforestry is, though, um, and, and Andrew has covered this, so I won't, I won't linger on this point, but it's basically the deliberate integration of woody vegetation, aka trees and shrubs, with crops and or animal systems to benefit from that, those resulting ecological interactions and economic interactions. Um, and it very much is about um, deliberate and intentional use. It's not you know, it's not just a case of like, oh, there are some trees here and there are some sheep over there, so therefore it's agroforestry. It's about deliberate integration. And sometimes you might hear different words. So agroforestry is like the umbrella term, the overarching term for all of these systems. And then silver pasture is the integration of trees and livestock. So silvo trees, pasture, obviously pasture. And then silvo arable is the integration of trees and arable crops. And we're seeing a lot more of this kind of um, silver arable happening um, across the UK and there's some excellent examples sort of in the central belt of Scotland and um, if any of you are interested then um, I can share some details if you get in touch at the end of the webinar. Um, these photos just give some examples of elsewhere in Europe where these systems are being um, in use and that one in the top particularly if any of you are interested I would really recommend looking up the Deheza systems of um, Spain where these integrated silver pastoral systems have been in existence for centuries um, and they're really really beautiful and there was a great woodland trust video i think that um, shared some of the um, findings when a team from scotland went over to to spain to explore that system so there are some excellent uh, eco sort of ecosystem services which is something that we're a term we're hearing more and more about um, as a a kind of policy output requirement like what what are the public goods or the ecosystem services that agroforestry can deliver excuse me um and for me i like to think about these things as what are the benefits for for us so it's you know thinking about it in less technical language food both for us in terms of if you've got top fruit uh, kind of trees or nut trees 
uh, quite often hear people say, you know, in the argument against tree planting, that you can't eat trees, um, but you can eat crops and livestock. But actually, you know, you can obviously get harvestable food from trees. Uh, fuel is a great, um, a great benefit. Uh, fiber, obviously, from trees, but also for uh, if you if you're running sheep for wool. Um, obviously, other livestock for leather. The shelter benefits are fantastic. Um, carbon storage. Now, there's a, a researcher who is um, an incredibly well-known researcher, Pete Smith from Aberdeen University, professor, and he talks a lot about, you know, if we are going to have livestock in our systems, the clearest way that we can ensure that we're having um, a significant carbon sequestration benefit is by implementing silver pasture. Um, you know, we can have arguments and measurements and tests all day long about grassland sequestration potential, but actually in terms of actual immediate carbon storage solutions, then silver pastoral systems are definitely going to deliver. Um, so hearing that from somebody who is, who is you know, not necessarily always been on the side of livestock was a really positive thing to hear. Water management we've talked about, which is becoming increasingly important as we go through periods of very wet weather and very dry weather. Um, and these are things that we're definitely seeing, particularly from benefits of planting alder and willow, which are both excellent at coping in damp, soggy places and just helping us manage that water so that it's not held up in the ground um, too much and creating kind of um, anaerobic conditions. You know, they really those trees really do help to kind of maintain that, that soil health. Um, biodiversity enrichment, obviously, just putting trees in means that you're going to have a more diverse than if you've just got um, the sward. Uh, but the additional benefits of having trees in your system will mean that you're getting a much broader range of invertebrates, birds, um, and also mammals, particularly in upland settings. Landscape enhancement and animal welfare, which I'm going to come to in a bit. And as Andrew said, nutrient cycling, those really deep rooting um, trees are going to make a significant difference to how nutrients are exchanged across the soil profile. So not just at one single point, but at various depths across the, the soil. Um, which obviously all leads to soil health. So I realise I've given you a bit of a lecture there, sorry about that, but I just think it's really helpful to kind of quantify sometimes some of the benefits from these systems. So you might not think it, that this part of Scotland gets particularly hot and sunny, but with a changing climate, it definitely is. And so we definitely see that shelter and shade are significant benefits of these systems. So this is some of this older birch wood um, that we really enjoy putting the cattle through. Um, shelter from the sun really does prevent that heat stress, which can reduce productivity, particularly of dairy animals. Um, a lot of research has been done into heat stress impacts on um, productivity and of milk yield. Um, it can reduce conception rates both in females and decrease uh, male fertility, and it can really limit immune system effectiveness. And that, that research is all cited in the Agroforestry Handbook. I think there was a question a little while ago about resources. Um, the Agroforestry Handbook is free to download from both the Organic Research Centre website and also the Soil Association. Um, so it's definitely a worth, um, worth looking into as a resource in terms of planning, but also some of that underpinning um, background research about the benefits of agroforestry systems. And we, for sure, see the cattle really getting into that shade during those warmer days. Um, but it makes a significant difference to us being a, an outwintering system. So our cattle, as I said earlier, don't come inside at all at any point during the year. So having shelter from the wind and, and from rain does definitely prevent that cold stress. So if our animals are not having to deal with cold stress, it means that they're not losing condition. They're only eating what they need to. They're not trying to then regain condition. Um, and it allows us to create this kind of natural bond for them. And although in this photograph you can see these are coniferous trees, um, I'm just going to turn my video off because it's saying that my internet's unstable. Even um, kind of bare branch uh, trees in the winter will make a significant difference to blocking the wind um, and to helping animals stay more sheltered, uh, in particularly in quite exposed uh, situations like Andrew and I both have um, on our farms. Again, in these sort of harder winters that we're getting, being able to feed cattle under the trees makes a difference. Um, and it just, you can see that the photo on the left was the day before the photo on the right. So the amount of snow that has come down, but the cattle are nice and uh, clear there. They've been able to stay nice and sheltered under the trees overnight. 
Now, this is the part of silver pasture that I find absolutely fascinating, and it's the aspect of nutrition. So we know that the trees have got deeper and different profiled roots to grasses and other um, species that you'd find in the sward. So they're able to exchange a wider range of nutrients across the soil profile, as I've already mentioned. And this means that trees can better supply nutrients such as manganese, selenium and copper um, to animals that might not be able to get those from the grasses. Now, across the UK, we have a selenium deficiency. Quite often pe hear people say, oh, well, on our farm, we don't have very great, we don't have great selenium. That is the case pretty much across the UK. So any trees that enable animals to better access that mineral um, are going to be beneficial. So we know that willow and alder both accumulate high concentrations of zinc and cobalt. Um, they also, uh, particularly willow, can help with selenium as well. Um, and it also can reduce the need for additional bought in minerals. We, do, we don't give our animals any other minerals. It doesn't fit everybody. Um, I'm not saying that everyone should do that, but for us, we blood test and we found that, you know, we don't need to give our animals anything else. They're getting what they need from what we're providing from the trees and the plants. And willow also contains salicylic acid, which is a relative of aspirin. So if you've got cattle, um, for example, that are in pain or going through any kind of, um, yeah, kind of issues, then giving them some willow cuttings is also a really positive thing to do. There is a brilliant resource, and I will email the link out um, to this after the webinar. I'll send it to everybody, which is um, an excellent fodder tree um, database for the whole of Europe. Um, so this work was done in basically it's a lovely spreadsheet that you can choose your tree and it will tell you what the nutrient profile is. Um, so, for example, I noticed that our cattle were really going for hawthorn in the spring um, and there are definitely definite season, seasonal shifts to the nutrient benefit of different trees. So I was interested in why, you know, why hawthorn in the spring? What is it about that plant at that time? Um, and using this resource, I was able to find that it has a particularly high peak of iron during the springtime, which was really interesting. And I was kind of thinking about, you know, well, so what, what does that mean for our cattle? But it's a great resource, um, just if you're interested in kind of aligning your observations with um, the nutrients of the trees, but also thinking about if you're planning a different plant, you know, planting regime, what might be useful in your setting. Um, I'm hoping, I don't know if this video will play. Maybe this is Betty eating some of the willow in one of our, hopefully you're seeing that okay. But plenty, plenty of grass available there and she's munching away at those trees. And again, things like zinc, copper, manganese all have um, massive benefits to our cattle for healthy hooves, for bone growth, um, immunity uh, and enzyme production. And just as an example at the bottom here, I've just put a little graph in uh, a table in to demonstrate the difference between PRG, so perennial ryegrass, which is normally the go-to for most uh, kind of improved agricultural pasture systems, and um, just how different trees compare. So you can see that um, goat willow is particularly high in zinc compared to perennial ryegrass. Um, that common hazel um, is much higher in copper uh, and in manganese as well. Um, and you can also see that in iron, you know, actually the perennial ryegrass is slightly higher. And maybe if I'd compared hawthorn, that would have been uh, that would have shown more of a difference. But you can just see this tiny snapshot that there is just such a difference between these plants that actually we maybe need to think a little bit more about this when we're planning our silver pasta systems. Oh, I've got no surprise videos. What's going on here? OK, so this is a, a tree hay bouquet that I gave to one of our heifers who was just looking a little under the weather, a bit of a snotty nose. Um, this particular field they're in didn't have masses amount of uh, access to, to trees. Um, so I'll just share the video. I'm not, I'm not sure if these videos are playing okay um, for you guys, but, but hopefully you're able to see them. And it just sort of demonstrates that these, these, tree, these animals are quite keen at uh, you know, getting a munch on some of these leaves. The other really key thing, and you know, Andrew's mentioned this already, is this idea of natural behaviours. Um, and trees make the most perfect scratching posts to help shed hair and dead skin. And I always think it's interesting when people put brushes up in their sheds for their cattle to rub on that, you know, you could go and plant some trees maybe if, you're, if you've got cattle outside instead. Um, and you'd get the additional biodiversity and carbon storage benefits than having a, a, a brush on the wall. But, but there we go. 
Um, and it, there is research that suggests that cattle, particularly in silver pastoral systems, have been found to express more socio-positive behaviours than those just in a monoculture grass pasture. So more licking behaviours, more um, positive interactions with each other, and also have more stable herd structures. So in the, the bunt order, where the, or the pecking order it's sometimes called, um, where they're kind of having their, uh, who's the matriarch and how those um, those relationships are established, it's much more settled in silver pastoral systems. So for us, that means when we're introducing new cows to the herd on the rare occasion that happens, that we're trying to always do that in the woodland because um, it just helps the cattle to kind of put trees between each other and feel a bit safer. So hopefully this video will play. Um, so this is just Betty having a good old scratch on a perfectly shaped branch. And there's another video again, I think here. I'm hoping you guys are seeing these videos okay. Um, that one I particularly like because she goes straight after scratching her face onto eating docks. Um, and most people don't think that docks are palatable, but the, the wee mob love them. Um, I'm very quickly just going to run through uh, kind of how a cattle act as ecosystem engineers in a silver pastoral setting. So this isn't always just about in, uh, integrating cattle with trees. But we also sometimes use them to prepare for planting. So this is uh, this is my husband, James, standing next to a fence. And on the right hand side of the picture, you can see tufted hair grass and docks that are taller than him. Um, now James, James is five foot eight. So, um, uh, yeah, they're, they're pretty tall, these plants. And um, we knew that we wanted to put a hedge along this this fence and we were just it's pretty boggy and it's a dip off the road and it's difficult to get any sort of machinery there. And we, we don't use any machinery on in our setting. And we thought, well, how can we clear some of this? So we brought two heifers in um, and basically bale grazed along this, uh, this fence line. So we put hay exactly where we wanted them to trample and where we wanted them to eat. Um, and you can see afterwards, actually, the impact that we were able to make just by putting the cattle on there. It's significantly easier to plant, plant a hedge when the ground looks like that than when it was a, a five foot plus um, tufted hair grass and docks. So, you know, not only are the cattle uh, integrated with the trees, but they're also helping us to prepare for planting. And the second part of this, once we'd got our hedge in, we noticed that there was quite a lot of um, other plants coming up. Um, and we didn't want to use uh, any sort of pesticides. Um, we're not organic certified, but we run to organic principles. And we weren't, we didn't feel that mulching uh, this particularly long hedge was something that was that we had time for. And there was a lot of conf kind of conflicting information about whether you should mulch or what you should use. So we decided to bring the laying hens in and put them to work here. Um, and we were directly feeding around the base of the, the hedge. Um, and after we would, I don't know if you can see in the photo at the top, but we use poultry netting just to section off the areas that we wanted them. Um, so they were doing a section of hedge at a time. And every time we moved them onto a new section, we would clean out their house and put all of the bedding as a mulch around the bottom of the, um, the hedge plant. So that just meant that it was a bit easier in terms of labor. We didn't have to mulch it all in one go. You can see here, it is quite a long hedge, um, but we were able just to mulch as we went after the, um, the surrounding plants had been kind of scratched out and eaten down by the chickens. Um, and then you can see, yeah, the establishment um, is, has just been brilliant. And the, the hedges now are in their third year and it's, it's incredible how well it's, it's established and growing. Um, so it's definitely something I would recommend as being a, a really good way to promote um, healthy trees and hedges. And it's pretty easy to do with a, a flock of, you know, a small flock of chickens or hens or a much, much larger flock. Uh, yeah, just coming. But there's just now going to be lots of photos of cows and trees because it's one of my favourite things to take pictures of. Um, we graze both in kind of very natural woodland that has established, but also in some areas where we've got more alleyways like this. Um, and again, these are perfect for uh, really bad weather. So we know that the first weekend of February is always going to snow. It just does. Um, so we quite often plan our grazing around that. I mentioned earlier that we use holistic management, part of which is holistic planned grazing. Um, you might know it by other sort of similar names like adaptive multi paddock grazing, mob grazing, etc. So our cattle never graze anywhere for more than a day at a time. 
Um, so that, as Andrew said, is really key to a successful uh, silver pasture system. You have to keep your animals moving. It's not it just doesn't work if you just chuck them in a wood and leave them there. The damage that they'll do to the trees, the poaching that you get, um, the, the suppression of grass growth is just, it's just too, yeah, it, it just becomes really damaging. So planning our uh, grazing in the woods around the seasons is definitely something that we do. So we think about where are we carving? When's the worst weather? When's the hottest weather? Plan all of that and then fill the gaps in with all of our other grazing around that. Um, yeah, you can see here the electric fence that we use. So it's just a single wire um, Kiwi tech that we're, we're able to string up. And because it's um, really light and easy on these kind of quite difficult areas, this is pretty rocky and it's quite hilly, um, but it still means that we're able to get, get the cattle around here pretty easily. Um, I would definitely say that the first time that you see a cow reaching up to eat, in this case, Rowan, um, from a tree, you suddenly realise that it's the most natural thing in the world and that all, all cattle should have access to trees. It's a very natural and I think quite a beautiful site. Um, and it really confirmed for us that, that this approach definitely was the right thing, just seeing how well suited they are to being in the trees. Um, and you can see here, this is uh, probably July, maybe June, July. There's pretty good grass growth, even amongst the trees there. Um, so we don't have any concerns about kind of competition between trees and grasses. Um, nature doesn't actually work kind of that much in competition. There's always a niche to be filled, um, but it's not something that we particularly worry about. And if anything, as Andrew said, tricky times of the year, you actually see better grass growth. And even in uh, you know early early spring when there's very little green grass about, um, we still try and let the cattle get in amongst the trees, and you can see that they enjoy um, enjoy that even when there's no leaves. Um, and yeah, oh, the brilliant thing about trees is they make excellent uh, fence posts as well. So you can see our uh, electric fence here being hung off a tree makes uh, makes life a lot easier. Um, and even our neighbor's sheep got the silver pasture memo. Um, you can see here, there's a few sheep. And if you look in the middle of the photo, right at the back, there's a sheep that's just reaching up, trying to eat, eat some of the leaves off that, that tree there. Um, so I think, oh, and then I just wanted to mention about uh, natural regeneration. So this is uh, in the birch woodlands that I showed earlier. And this is uh, Rowan, natural regeneration. And this is the day after the cattle have been through. So sometimes people worry about natural regeneration and cattle and the competition element or them eating the plants, but they tend to, um, you know, as long as you're kind of moving them on and you're allocating their, their grass or any hay that you're feeding accordingly, they generally won't take out, um, won't take out saplings, we found. Um, and then the idea would be just to come in and pop either a, a cactus guard or um, just a, you know, a standard tree guard around that. The biggest issue for us is that, that the deer will come in afterwards and eat that. So it's about finding those, those saplings and quickly getting some protection around them if we can. As we know, natural regeneration um, is, is much better for woodland restoration in terms of um, the genetic ability of these trees to be perfectly suited to the area. Uh, more and more as more tree planting targets are going in, um, trees are coming from all over the place. So. The, the primary sort of type of tree that you want to be supporting really is natural regeneration because they have that perfect genetic ability to cope with the conditions that they are, um, that they're growing in. And yeah, as I said, timing is key. Um, it really does require responsive and adaptive management, being able to look at what's going on with the trees and the cattle or the sheep or whatever animals you've got in there and moving them. Um, we need to be uh, kind of for us, um, thinking about how each of the land that the landowners that we're working with want to manage the land um, and how we how we sort of support that. Um, and we really want to ensure kind of resilient systems that um, that agroforestry can can really sort of support. Um, and as I said, you know, there are so many benefits to agro, agro ecosystems uh, that integrate agroforestry um, that silver pasture has these real benefits, uh, both in terms of nutrients, but also the shelter and the, the natural behaviours. So I think that's me. I can see that there are loads of uh, questions that I've not been able to see because I've been chatting away to you all. Um, so, uh, yeah.
uh, I guess we've got some questions to go through. While I have a look through the chat to see if I can um, find some of those, um, we've got a question. Oh, where are we? There were some questions about, um, oh, someone asked about, could you repeat the reference to the silver pasture system in Spain, uh, Rupert? That was the Dehazes, so D-E-H-E-S-A-S. -E -S. Um, really recommend looking those up. Um, and just seeing if there are any other questions, but we had some questions earlier about uh, species mix. So Andrew, do you mind if I pass that one to you to answer while I just run through the chat and see if there's any other questions I've missed? So what, what species would you be, be going for and why? Yeah, no, sure, Nikki. Um, the thing we've already talked about canopy and the type of canopy, we haven't talked about the type of canopy. So uh, species like birch or indeed ash, um, ash dieback's obviously a problem, absolutely ideal for a silver pasture system because they are a light canopied species, let a light, lot of light through and grass grows underneath. Um, spruces, for instance, are much less suitable and uh, Nikki was using some conifer. I think that was there was some Grandis in there, um, or uh, Douglas, or um, in those photographs. And if you have just a few of those, that's fine. But if you've got nothing but those, then you're not going to have any cross growing underneath. Um, so canopy type is really important. A light canopied species suit silver pasture systems. But as Nikki was pointing out, having some heavier canopies in there, particularly in the winter time is really good for stock or in bad weather. So for us, um, Scots pine has been one that does that job. Um, and um, we've also done a lot on oak as well, which mightn't be your first choice species, but actually it does create a very good dry environment under the, under the dead leaves that it retains. Um, but so it's silver pasture systems tend to lend themselves to mixtures and different species and then you it's just a, a kind of basic tree question which species grow well with which so gene and birch grow very well together for instance but birch and pine grow well um, and in a Scottish context in an upland context you keep coming back to birch um, and it's uh, a tree that I think would be in every silver pasture system in upland UK. Um, it, other trees would be there too, but birches it would be a key one. Does that, uh, does that help? Are you yeah. back? You're back, Nikki. You've done your research. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely agree with Birch. Um, and obviously where we may be seeing, uh, if folk are thinking about rather than planting, but are looking to kind of nudge succession, then obviously as a pioneer species, they'd be seeing Birch possibly coming through anyway as well. Um, we definitely uh, rely on willow. Um, it, it's brilliant scrub because where um, the cattle can kind of munch it down quite hard in the winter, um, which they really enjoy doing, you know, they will just be eating twigs essentially. Um, but the willow scrub um, can stay quite small and tight um, and it's a fantastic habitat and we have quite a lot of it alongside um, gorse scrub. So in terms of shelter and habitat, that's brilliant. Which reminds me of um, a, a paper that came out by um, a ecologist farmer, uh, Professor Williams, who's based at uh, Bangor University, released a paper earlier this year about um, kind of how sheep uh, lamb mortality is, is affected by access to things like hedges and uh, scrub in lambing pastures. So um, kind of giving us the evidence that we probably knew already that as long as as long as lambs have got somewhere to shelter um, under hedges and scrub, then they're, you know, they're probably going to survive better. Um, but it's great to see that the, the research is kind of supporting some of these systems now, particularly very much in an upland UK context. Um, yeah, so I'd say definitely my kind of hero hero species are ash because cattle uh, and sheep love it. Um, though obviously ash dieback being the issue, uh, birch for sure, um, and definitely also um, willow, absolutely willow, and various different types of willow. Um, 
I think for us as well, oak, yeah, like you said, Andrew, oak uh, does have a role to play. I think some people worry about acorns and potential poisoning, but if you're moving your animals regularly, they're not going to eat the acorns. Um, you know, it's only when animals are left in a set stop situation and they've got nothing else to eat will they start eating them. And we do see the cattle eating the um, eating the oak leaves, uh, particularly in the autumn. And they have a high tannin content, which can really help in terms of reducing the need for, for wormers, um, which I didn't mention in the presentation, but we also don't worm. Um, we use fecal egg counts as a way of testing to see whether we need to. Um, but again, they keep coming back as either zero or incredibly low. And I think that that's due to the amount of alder um, and, and oak uh, that, the, that the cattle are eating. You'll generally see in any literature that alder is considered un considered unpalatable um, because of the high tanning content and that livestock won't eat it, but they will just they at certain yeah. times of the year. They yeah. do. Yeah. Um, one, can I, Nikki, can I yeah. um, just pick up at one point you made about the um, boy from Bangor and his research on... on um, uh, lamb mortality. Yes, shelter is important for lambs, but the most important thing for lambs is the quality and quantity of colostrum from the mother. That's the best predictor of lamb survival, as the uh, Scottish Agricultural College research shows. So then the question is, how do you best, most efficiently ensure that the yow's got good colostrum? And that is about body condition, body score. And if she's been kept in a highly exposed place over the winter time, she's less likely to be producing good colostrum. That is the key point that we find about shelter and sheep. It's getting the mother in, in the right condition to the point where she's going to lamb. And yes, you've got to have shelter to, to stop the lamb dying from exposure. But um, that's the that's the key point. Um, yeah, and I'm sure any shepherd shepherd will understand that. Yeah, that's such a good point that it isn't just about that point of lambing; it's the whole system, isn't it? And kind of thinking yeah. about then ensuring that you're using that shelter to to, as I mentioned, you know, kind of maintaining that um, that body condition and and reducing the need for feed. Um, and talking about feed, I think somebody had asked a question about whether we're supplementary feeding. Um, so we try and get through as much of the year as we possibly can on stockpile. So we defer grazing, um, which means um, we basically skim round our grazing. So everything, we never really take anything right down um, to very short um, until it's maybe April. Uh, grass doesn't grow, grow here until May, really. So um, we can afford to take stuff right down at, at the point in April if we really Really need to but ideally we like to leave quite a lot behind because we are managing um not only for for the cattle health but also for abundance and diversity in in the ecology as well so we want to create structural diversity which enables that um and so we tend to not feed hay until um maybe january time so normally we don't need to add hay in unless we're in a very particular setting like we were uh, back in November, we were grazing what had been undersown arable, um, and it was very, it was just mono, monoculture ryegrass. So we fed hay just to create a bit of diversity in the diet. But no, we try and try not to to supplementary feed. And the ideal would be to not have to feed any conserved forage and to make do with um, con, to, with deferred grazing. But that's tricky somewhere that gets as much snow as we do. Um, uh, Rupert has asked if we can go back to the establishment questions. We can in a second, Rupert, I promise. Um, but there is just a question I want to touch on first, which is about if 50% tree canopy is in a field, is the number of livestock units per hectare reduced by 50% or can it support proportionally more than that? It's not, there's definitely not a correlation between 50% tree cover means reductions of 50% livestock units. Um, Andrew, I don't know if you've got thoughts on that, but as far as I can see, um, and what we're particularly if you're moving your animals and you're in quite a decent rotation, then your carrying capacity actually increases. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily need to reduce your livestock units. Um, Andrew, unless you've got any thoughts on that. No, no, but the, there is um, a, not a linear relationship, if I mind right, from the research work done um, in the 1980s when agroforestry was a great flavor of interest then, but it wasn't because of animal interests, it was because they saw it as a way to reduce grass growth. And they were trying to limit the um, mountains of butter and lakes of milk and all the rest of it. 
Um, so there was very careful work done then. And if I mind right, the uh, relationship is not a straight linear one. As you increase canopy cover, you reduce grass growth. It's more, sh sh it's, it's a, a slower reduction and then a catastrophic drop off as you get up to high canopy covers. Um, but it does affect the palatability through the amount of sugars. So the plants respond in different ways to reducing light levels. And uh, you will also expect, uh, affect uh, the species composition too. Um, so it's, it's an interesting and important one, but it's not as someone has suggested that if you've got 50% canopy cover, you have to reduce your stock by 50%, absolutely not. So as promised, let's go back to establishment. Um, so uh, I guess the questions were particularly linked to um, can you, how do you establish when you've already got animals on the land? I think that's a really good point. So, you know, you've, you've got your 10 acre fields and you've got animals grazing in it and you want to integrate trees. Uh, how do you do that without the animals just plowing into them? Um, from our point of view, uh, we definitely would be using electric fencing to, to do that. And I think it's also important to maybe take a multi-year approach and try not to get all of your trees in all in once. Some people do that and that works really well for them because they can just take stock off that field and do that planting. Um, but, but for us, I think we'd probably think about planting in stages so that we can then manage where we're grazing um, in other places. Or if we need to still graze in that field, we can just section some of it off with electric fence to keep keep the livestock away. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing would be potentially to make use of cactus guards. Um, so, uh, or obviously building um, wooden tree protection uh, using kind of post and rail setup or fencing around trees. Um, I just mentioned cactus guards because I've seen them being used pretty effectively and they are relatively, cheap in that you can once the tree is established you can take them down and reuse them so um, that does mean that they're pretty pretty good for that um, so that would be that would be my approach I guess would be to try and plan it in a way that I'm not trying to do it all at once so that my grazing is completely thrown out the window um, and that I can try and manage establishment alongside uh, grazing but Andrew have you got thoughts on on planning for establishment? Well we've taken two approaches one on bigger areas um, we've excluded stock for the a, a period of a few years to get the sheep uh, to get the trees established, and then once they're robust enough, you get the sheep in uh, first, and then cattle. Um, but in smaller areas, we, we we tried both approaches of letting animals in amongst young trees and protected with tubes and doing the excluding thing, and. Where we're at just now is that every year we're planting another little bit of a field margin, but we're using um, an electric fence to keep the cattle off and to keep the red deer away, which is we've got a red deer problem here. And we use ordinary tree guards, the kind of one pound horrible plastic things, I'm afraid, but we do recycle them um, with a wooden stake. And we accept some losses. So we don't do it through the grant system. Uh, we do it um, outside of the grant system. So we carry the risk, but we don't carry the worry that some government inspector is gonna come along and say that our trees are dead. And what we find is that we lose about between five and 10% of the trees that we plant with just ordinary tree tubes and wooden stakes. The, um, it's slightly influenced by if you planted the sweetest ground, you're going to get the highest grazing pressure there. So the quality of the ground is, is what matters. But it, for us, it's about money. And protecting trees individually is expensive, whatever, even using the one pound tree tube. But the more, you know, the more wood you use, the more expensive it becomes. So it's about money. And bigger areas, you're much cheaper just to put a fence around if you can manage your stock around it. And for us, one of the key moves has been, and we've talked about this before, we moved from a set stocking to a rotational grazing, and you immediately improve the grass availability for your animals. And if you step that up to the kind of system that Nikki runs, a mob grazing system and stock and move every, every day or whatever, you improve your grass utilization even more. So you can make space to some degree, depends where you are in your, in your grazing management. Um, so that's been our approach. It's all about money, money. 
Yeah, definitely. And I would say that for any planting we've done that, none of that has been through uh, government funded schemes. We operate entirely outside of subsidies. So that isn't something that we've kind of used at all. Um, though we have made use of the uh, Woodland Trust More Hedges grant, which has been brilliant. Um, so that has enabled us to put in the hedges that I was showing with the chickens. Um, and again, we've not lost in fact, I don't think we've lost any touch wood. We've not lost any of the, the trees that we put in in that hedge yet. Um, and then we've also worked with the Woodland Trust and a local organisation who uh, a climate act, a climate action group who wanted to plant some trees. Um, so they sourced the trees. We offered the land for them to be planted on. Um, and then local people came out and planted the trees. Um, and again, you know, making use of that support from the Woodland Trust was important. Um, but for us in the future, again, we would be recycling our tree tubes and um, we've just got piles of them here. And between us and a friend, um, we basically just reuse each other's tree tubes. Um, and that that's worked pretty well. Um, and then when they get to the point where they're kind of really past it, they get sent off to Solway to be recycled. Um, there is a question that Emma's just asked about, have either of you created an area of wood pasture by fencing it off and seeing what naturally regenerates? And I um, uh, I guess the, the answer is no, and that's because I deeply believe that, that large herbivores are vital for to enable succession. Um, and what we would probably see here is that tall grasses like the um, tufted hair grass and millennia will just take over and then there'd be very little chance of, of trees being able to, to come through that because they completely map the ground. So, so you know, our, our experience here is that, that cattle particularly are absolutely vital to enabling that succession to happen. Um, and we've been then seeing, as I showed in the, in the um, presentation, uh, Rao and Birch and Willow all naturally regenerating and, and also Oak actually, interestingly, and I think we've probably got the Jays to thank for that. Um, and that is all part of you know, the regeneration and the, the diversity of plants that are coming through as part of our biodiversity focused grazing management that we've been implementing for the last three years. Um, I don't know if there's any other establishment questions that folk wanted to ask, but feel free if you want to, to unmute and ask those if we've not really covered the things that you were hoping to hear from us in terms of uh, establishment. Lizzie, did you want to come in there? I can see you've got your yes, hands up. Yes, yeah, yeah. Hi, um, Hi, yeah, this is brilliant. I'm really enjoying this. Um, we have a very small amount of land. We're under five hectares in the North Tyne, and we have a very rushy west facing slope of land that is very poor for um, grazing. So at the moment, our grazier uses it for about three or four months of the year, and then the rest of the time is just left to its own. I would love to put some sort of agroforestry on the land in the hopes that if I was using willow and alder, that could actually help combat the wet. But would it, at the moment, we have some woodland down the bottom, but we have to go in, well, we've had to go in and scythe back and strim back the rushes that have come up to support the trees. Would it be possible and just take a long time or is it really not worth doing? Uh I, mean, I think it's worth doing. We have natural regeneration of alder in some rushy areas here. Um, so we are just leaving them alone. We don't manage our rushes. We just in, in, incorporate them into our grazing management and the, the cows, particularly at this time of year, pregnant cows really like eating rushes at this time of year. Um, so, uh, which is an odd, odd observation that we've made. Um, but yeah, I would definitely say that, um, particularly if you feel that the ground doesn't have the grazing potential that you'd want from it, that putting in some trees would be a really good idea because even if you're not, um, you know, even if they don't kind of fix the drainage issue, it sounds like there's a bit of a, um, you know, a kind of uh, soil functioning, water cycling uh, issue going on there. But um, yeah, maybe the trees would would add additional benefits instead. So it might be that they don't fix that, but that, you know, that there are other benefits. Andrew, what do you think about alder and willow in a on a wet bank, maybe? Oh, yes, absolutely. But um, a couple of words, words of caution. One, um, is there a, are there any drains involved? Because if that might not be affecting this system, but it might affect a bit of ground down below you or something or other. Just think about drains and it's maybe it's not drained. If it's very glade ground and it's a heavy kind of clay ground, then um, 
uh, you might not get rid of the rushes, but you will develop a much more diverse flora with the willow and the alder and everything else that's there. And, and it just makes it a much more interesting place, if nothing else. So absolutely go for it. Um, alder likes ground where the water is moving through and it's not stagnant. So just think, think about that aspect. But I guess your seasonal, there'll be a seasonality to your water table. And if, it is, if that is the case, then um, both Alder and Willow are going to do well in that kind of setup. So yeah, give it a try. Give it a try. Uh, there, thanks, Andrew. Are there any other questions that folk have got? Feel free to. Un I'm trying to see if there's anyone with hands up or anything. I'm not seeing that. No. Okay. Um, Andrew, I've got a question for you. Um, in terms of your future plans, you've talked about you're putting in, um, like every year you're putting in a little bit more in terms of shelter belts and on field margins and things. You've got that kind of really, as we saw, beautiful um, silver pasture system that kind of is really well established now. Are you, have you got plans to put in anything, um, anything else of that scale anywhere? I, yeah, we do. We've actually just taken on, um, well, our daughter has joined us in the business. It seems like a funny place to start, but that means um, we need more, need more income coming in to pay for the, pay for the wage. And so um, we've luckily been able to take on an extra block of ground, um, which is quite a substantial bit of rather poor hill ground. It's been set stock with sheep and it has a, it's just knackered in to, put it bluntly and I think we all know what knackered hill ground looks like in Scotland we've got plenty of it so uh, there's some great opportunity there and uh, working with the Woodland Trust we're looking to put in a 20 hectare block and we're going to use the government grant system if we can get it um, and get into it and that will be a pine birch rowan kind of system with um, oak on the slightly better ground and uh, I'm very confident we can make it work. Uh, we'll have to dodge around the grant rules and um, hopefully there's no one from the forestry department listening to this just now, but I don't imagine they listen to this kind of stuff. <laughs> I'm absolutely not, it's not their thing, but um, we will have to work and that will involve thinning to make it a, a, a suitable system once the trees are up and established and even on poor poorer ground it is mineral soils but it's podzilized soils and it's you know it's a knack of dry heath that's got bracken encroaching on it badly it's um it, i would imagine five six years after establishment we can put sheep in so yeah, yeah we, we are planning big scale yeah, yeah, or bigger scale. And we're lucky we can work at scale here. It's it's a big privilege, I know that. But uh, ultimately that block of hill land, um, I think over my, hopefully I've got enough working life left in me and I would envisage it will be 50% um, uh, afforested. And we won't have altered the stocking one little bit on it. Nice. So that's, oh, that's our vision. exciting. That's our vision. And that's, uh, what is it, 200 hectare. Um, block uh, of ground. Yeah, well, that, just that's a, roughly what we did. Just a wee block then. <laughs> just a wee block, yeah. Well, we're going to try and do one. If it works, we'll do one a year. And I think by improving, doing some um, bracken, uh, an element of bracken control to improve the grazing, that we can manage the grazing system and get trees on the ground and pull the pull, pull stock back into the trees when the trees are ready. So uh, um, I'm, I stand to be corrected and I might get it completely wrong, but uh, that's, that's where we're headed. And we're driven largely by, or partly by biodiversity interests, but also carbon interests and stock welfare interests. Those, those are the things. I'm trying to run a business that works. Those are the things that motivate us. Brilliant. We've got a flurry of questions have suddenly come in, so I'm better just go through those. But um, that was great to hear about. Uh, Vicky wanted to know about walnuts in silver pasture. I wouldn't plant them this far north and at this elevation. But Andrew, you're much more knowledgeable about trees than I am. Have you got any thoughts about including walnuts in uh, in a silver pasture system? Uh, well, walnut is a standard species uh, to be used in in more southerly climes, and maybe in fifty or hundred years time. 
with <laughs> sounds like climate warming is going to be a nice thing. It won't be a nice thing, I suspect. But um, no, I I wouldn't put it in Scotland. You can grow it, and there are trees down in, in Highland Perthshire growing, but. Um, I wouldn't put uh, walnut into a system here. In the south of England, absolutely, yeah. Possibly in southwest Scotland, I don't know, but not 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 where I live. Excellent, yeah. And the, the sunny sunny climes of Ayrshire, maybe it would work well, possibly. Yeah. <laughs> but possibly, um, yeah. <laughs> Evie's asked about aspen as a good tree to grow, and I can't believe I didn't mention aspen already because it's a wonderful tree. Um, and I would say that there's some yeah some fantastic work being done uh, by. Um, Peter, whose name I can't remember, and do you know who I mean? Who's doing some? I do work? know who you mean, and I can't remember his second name. I just remember <laughs> Peter. Um, uh, but he's yeah, no, absolutely, and Aspen absolutely is a tree um, to be used in such systems. It's one that regenerates here and has come into our wood pasture system. Um, and we've that happened because we've run the rotational grazing system and uh, that has allowed aspen to regenerate um so uh it's definitely definitely in there yep um here's a great question from dabeth about um farmland birds um and planting trees in the uplands having an effect on birds such as curlew and lapwing and um, I, I can see that Rebecca Watts from the National, Cairngorm National Park is in the audience and Rebecca will know the, the ongoing de debates that I have with her with her colleague Vicky, who is the wader officer uh, in, in the National Park. Um, and this is kind of these this ongoing issues. And I, you know, from, from a very personal point of view, I would say that I think the biggest the biggest risks for curlew and lapwing are, you know, in some intensive arable production and, and land use change that is is happening elsewhere. Um, and, you know, the previously, if you look at historic maps of the uplands, they would have been much more wooded. Um, and the reason that we have uh, so many more kind of, the, of these birds in these areas now are because they're being ousted from, 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 from lowland areas. Not in every case, but I think, that, yeah, it's definitely, it's a bigger picture to me than just uh, land use change in the uplands. I think, you know, the reason that we're trying to protect uh, waders in in particular areas is because they've really been displaced from from other parts of of the countryside so it is a challenge and uh and, you know and there's ongoing research into into how how do we um how do we manage our land and these mosaics for for biodiversity to include waders and i think yeah there's a comments about uh predator pressure is is often going to be an issue but Andrew have you got thoughts about the kind of uh in, interactions between um waders and other protected bird species and tree planting well yes I do and um the biggest issue for curlews and lapwings is predator pressure and here it's the badger is our main predator and badger, funnily enough, is not so much of a woodland animal here as a grassland animal. It spends its life rooting around looking for worms, um, and uh, it's a it's a, that's a big issue. But the, in terms of the structure of a landscape, um, some element of trees and maybe 20, 30, 40 percent uh, are forested in relatively small blocks with gaps between them, such as you would have in, uh, such as we are planning to have on, on this new bit of hill ground we've taken on. Um, I know Curlew can cope with that. Uh, it's about the predators that are in there, probably. That's, that's probably the biggest issue affecting breeding success. If you've 100% are forested, you've lost your Curlews and your Peewits. So yeah, no, I understand that there is a balance there, but some element of afforestation. I used to work in, in uh, Scandinavia and they certainly are used to um, these birds nesting in semi-wooded habitats. So uh, some trees are, are, are okay, I would say. Look at the predators. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I think, uh, yeah, there's a couple of comments coming in on the chat, just kind of um, recognizing that, uh, you know, that the, the lowland waders have been driven away from the lowlands because of agricultural land use, but then the tree, so they've been pushed into the uplands and then the tree planting in the uplands is, is uh, displacing them there. It's, it's a massive, it's a massive challenge. And actually, I think, you know, this is more about rather than managing for individual species or plants or animals, it's about managing for, for complex 
uh, ecosystems and mosaic landscapes, uh, which I guess brings us back to the idea of agroecology, which is where kind of this series of events started off. Um, we're getting close to half past six, and I want to make sure that we finish on time. Um, Andrew, I'm so grateful that you were able to join us this evening and share so much of your knowledge um, with, with us all. Um, and it's been, it's always lovely for me to just share photos of cows in trees. So I'm, I'm really pleased that I was able to do that as well. Um, just uh, on a final thought, Andrew, so last, last question, in terms of um, either resources or, um, uh, I don't know, podcast books, websites, anything like that, do you have any kind of top tips for, for anyone attending where they might want to be able to get some further information from? Um, <laughs> I'm afraid I don't. That's not terribly useful, is it? <laughs> the Solar Association has a handbook, and that is a good starting point if you've never thought about this before. The um, There is a handbook which I think the Organic Research Centre also helped produce. I can't remember. You'll know, Nikki. Um, I'm afraid we've never used these kind of things. We, we just kind of followed our noses. So um, uh, I think that handbook is this agroforestry handbook. You, you will have the reference, do you, Nikki? Yeah, I'll send a link because you can download it. So when I, I'll send out an email to everyone who's attended this webinar and I will include a link to the Agroforestry Handbook. I will also include a link to that brilliant spreadsheet that has all of the different um, uh, nutritional value of the different trees. And I will also include a link to the uh, Woodland Trust More Hedges and More Trees schemes because they might be of interest to folk attending who are looking for support to, to access trees to put onto their land. Um, and I will also, um, there's some other brilliant webinars that have been done by other folk, such as Richard Lockett um, and uh, yeah, a few other, and some Scottish government representatives. There was a, um, they did a web webinar just a little while ago that kind of focused more on, um, on uh, the financing. Uh, and there's been some work done by SAC on that as well. So I will collate together some links um, to send round as a follow up from this webinar. Um, just before we finish, just a quick uh, to highlight, and I should have got the link already and sent that round and put it in the chat now, but I won't, I will send it in the follow up email. This is one of 15 events that have been happening across Scotland um, through January, February and March, looking at agroecology and supporting uh, changing mindsets. Um, we've still got a couple of events coming up. So I am delivering on Sunday, uh, an introduction to holistic grazing um, that's for uh, women only um, because of the uh, funding requirements for that but if you are interested you can drop me an email nikki at pfla.org.uk if you uh, weren't aware of that but want to come along i can see if we can get your place on that um, there is also an event on the 2nd of march um, at whitrigs uh, which is down near hoik in the borders um, and i know that that's going to be a brilliant day uh, looking at the uh, mitchell's farm where they moved away from sheep and have gone towards uh, deer and cattle um, and they're implementing a really successful outwintering system we've also got various other events that are going on um, next in the next few weeks uh, which again I will include a link in the follow-up email because you may be interested in attending both some of those face-to-face um, -face and online which reminds me that there is one uh, on Lewis which is particularly looking at um, electric collars and GPS collars for cattle and somebody did ask a question about that so if you're able to get up to Lewis you can go and hear about a crofter's experience of using um, the, the, the collars for uh, keeping their cattle um, on the common ground. So that's us at half past six. Thank you, Andrew, again, so, so much for your contribution this evening. Thank you all for attending. It's been uh, some great questions. It's always lovely to, uh, to be able to have good questions. Um, and thanks ever so much for, for joining us. Good evening. Have a lovely rest of your evening. Thanks very much, Nikki. Cheers. Cheers, Andrew. Take bye, care, bye, everybody. Bye.